But the question is, well, is that good for something? Well, I'm going to show you now. So uh, we don't only develop probes for DNA. We also develop probes for amino acid. So we are interested in uh, detecting uh, cysteine and cysteine containing amino acids. So you can see that cysteine is a semi-essential amino acid. Uh, you need about 4 milligrams uh, of, uh, of cysteine per kilogram of body weight in your diet. A blood serum contains about 300 micromolar of cysteine, which is quite, quite high. Uh, and uh, abnormal amount of cysteine have been associated with cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, um, pulmonary fibrosis, and AIDS. So we developed these compounds uh, that uh, basically uh, are capable of detecting cysteine. The compound is not fluorescent in the, present, in the absence of cysteine, but displays a strong photoluminescent response when it binds to cysteine. So let me show you. This is a complex without cysteine. This is the complex with one equivalent of cysteine. And uh, there's a lot of cysteine in the system, so you don't have to worry about it. If you titrate from 0 micromolar to 10 micromolar, and the concentration of the complex is 10 micromolar, you can see a linear increase in the concentration. Of course, we don't need to go to this uh, high concentration. We can detect down to 50 nanomolar, uh, changing the concentration of the complex, but just to show you uh, uh, how it works and uh, very good curves, and also the, the cysteine in blood serum is so high that these amounts are still low. But anyway, you can see very uh, easily the change in uh, color, and also I'm going to show you now the sensitivity. You can put other amino acids there. It doesn't really matter. It only sensitive if you put uh, the, the probe with alanine, arginine, histidine, lysine, nothing happens. It only reacts with cysteine, histidine, or uh, glutathione. These uh, three uh, uh, amino acids or, or small amino acid polymers that contain cysteine. Uh, not only that, cysteine, which is the oxidized, uh, oxidized cysteine, doesn't present any response. And uh, biomolecules or proteins that contain cysteines don't present any response either. So it's very sensitive to free cysteine. And, uh, and actually, we, start, we studied this compound because we were very interested in trying to figure out why there was this response. We did some uh, DFT calculations. And what we found out is that uh, uh, you see this imide here. Uh, basically, when you excite this uh, iridium compound, the excitation is located there. So this state is non-fluorescent, so it will decay back to the ground state without emitting any fluorescence. The parent compound that doesn't contain contains the imide, uh, it, it excitation, its fluorescent level is located in the phenantrolin. So then you get very nice photoluminescence. So when you get the histidine, the, the cysteine bound to the imide, uh, basically you see a redistribution in the electron density. So now the electron density is not located here, it's located in the phenantrolin. So that, that change in electronic distribution is what causes that now you see fluorescence from there. But the good thing about metal complexes is that they uh, display very long lifetimes. So now we can use time gating to do things that you cannot do with standard probes. So let me show you. We decided to uh, detect uh, cysteine in an environment that is prohibitive for any other kind of probe. Uh, this medium right here is what we call um, uh, Dubelco cell growing medium. So if any of you grow cells, you know this medium very well. It has a lot of uh, different kind of like ions. It has a lot of amino acids, different kind of amino acids, with the exception of cysteine. And it has a lot of inorganic, organic and, inor and inorganic dyes. It has fluorescent dyes, so it has a very strong fluorescence. And this fluorescence that you see here is out of fluorescence that comes directly from the Duvelco cell medium without any kind of probes in it. So you put our probes, uh, the iridium compound there, and you put one equivalent of cysteine, and you see a little bit of increase there, the signal to background ratio of just 1.14. So that is no detection whatsoever. But if you do time gating, you take the traces, you do the time gating optimization that you already know, so I'm not showing it here. 
you, you get that the optimum time gate is from 60 to 150 nanoseconds. And now, if you do the time gating, here you go. You get now a curve that doesn't look like this. It mostly looks like the iridium compound. And you still get a little bit of this here, but it's very, very marginal in comparison with you know, this huge photoluminescence. And now you get a signal to background ratio of about 11. So if you do a titration with histidine in this medium, if you use steady state spectroscopy, you get no sensitivity whatsoever. But if you use time resolved spectroscopy using time gating, you get a linear response now up to uh, one equivalent. So it's, it's, it's really remar remarkable how you can get from here no detection to here exactly in the same sample. It's exactly the same sample. We can do the same with histidine, although the probe is a little bit different, but histidine is Real, it's, it's really important. It's a, this is an essential amino acid. You need a, about 10 milligrams per, kilo, per kilogram in your diet. Blown serum contains about 100 micromolar. And uh, abnormal amounts have been associated with also Alzheimer's disease, uh, scromboid poisoning, and uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, so the kind of uh, probe that is capable of detecting histidine is now these kind of probes that have a 2D MSO uh, molecules coordinated to iridium. So these two DMSO molecules are very easy to displace. Here, instead of DMSO, we have acetonitrile molecules uh, uh, coordinated to iridium. But they are very easy to uh, displace by histidine. And uh, you can see that you get a very linear response as well on detection of histidine. And I'm not going to talk too much about this, but I just want to show you that if we tune the, electron, the electronic properties of the ligands, then you get different colors. So we can, get, we can go from green to blue. Uh, well, the one and three are basically the same with the section of uh, uh, the acetonitrile or DMSO. But you can even go to red or brown if you change the electronic properties of the ligand. So uh, we can also do this. And uh, I want to switch a little bit now uh, projects. Uh, we also have been doing. Uh, some research in trying to detect solvent vapors. And in this case, we have always known that rhenium complexes are solvatochromic. So if you change the solvent where you dissolve your rhenium complex, then it will change color. But the problem is, if you want to detect gases, it's a different story. Because you cannot have a, a rhenium complex in a solvent and bubble a gas to detect the gas. Uh, and if you have a crystal, then the gas will not be able to diffuse inside. So we decided to. Uh, try a different strategy. And what we actually did was to get a zeolite. In this case, this is zeolite Y. It's a phagocyte zeolite. And uh, we wanted to put the rhenium complex inside the zeolite. The problem is that if you look at it carefully, the rhenium complex is too big. It doesn't fit through the pores of the zeolite. So you cannot really put it inside. Well, you cannot put it inside like that, but you can do a technique that is quite, quite old that is called a chip in the bottle method. So that chip doesn't fit through here, but the individual pieces of the chip fit. So what we did was exactly that. We are going to load the individual pieces of the rhenium complex, and then we're going to assemble the rhenium complex inside there. So we actually did. This is the rhenium complex, the empty zeolite. We, we were able to put the rhenium pentacarbonyl chloride inside the zeolite. And now we sublimated phenantrolin, which is very sublimated, subli sublimable. So we basically uh, took away all, all the air. We put it in vacuum. We put some temperature. The, the phenantrolin basically percolated within the pores and then formed the, the rhenium complex inside the zeolite. So we know that we formed the rhenium complex because we did a lot of characterization techniques that we are, I'm not going to talk too much now. But if you put the the, uh, to, to make a suspension of the rhenium phenantrolin complex in zeolite, in zeolite Y, it looks beautiful under a black light. So what we did was to make films of that. And uh, we evaporated the solvent. And we use a very sophisticated uh, vapor chamber, which is basically a flask with a cap. And we put the solvent down here, and we let the vapors to diffuse naturally inside the, inside the cuvette. And here you see, no, here you don't see. You don't see that here there's another cuvette. 
And that cuvette contains uh, the, pow the, the film, but without exposing it to the vapor. And this is exposed to DMF. So you can see that immediately uh, the, the, the light switching properties of this compound in the presence of the vapors. So let me show you what you can do with that. Well, we, we determined that there are three parameters that change in this material when they are exposed to solvent. The color, you can see that the maximum of the, of the complex changes depending on the vapor that it was exposed. So you can go from red when you expose it to water vapor to kind of like uh, green, uh, bluish green when you expose it to isopropanol. And you can go from orange, yellow, green, pale blue, a little bit bluer. So it kind of like, uh, it gives you a whole range of colors. But on, not only that, the intensity changes too. So the black line here is without vapor, and the intensity increases depending on the vapor. Uh, the highest is with the DMF, but the MSO is quite high. Acetonitrile is quite high too. And here is the, the fall increase. So this is a 70-fold increase in fluorescence. So it's quite high too. We also determined that the lifetime changes. So depending on the solvent, the lifetime changes. And then we thought, well, with these three parameters, we can make a map. So we made a chip in the bottle, so we need a map for the chip. So here you are. Uh, you have uh, aprotic solvents here. You have alcohols here. Non-protic solvents. Uh, well, non-polar solvents here and very, very strongly protein, protein solvents uh, that, that actually make uh, hydrogen bonding here. Um, if you look at the uh, planar map from the top, then you will see that they are grouped in different regions. So actually it creates a three-dimensional map of solvents, vapors, that now they are not based on other property that the optical properties of the renin complex. So a protics here, alcohols here, non-polars, and protic. Well, Finally, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, our work with uh, ruthenium complexes and how we can uh, detect uh, proteins that causes diseases like, uh, or well, that are associated with diseases like in this case, amyloid beta. So uh, there are different theories about how uh, Alzheimer's disease actually happens, but uh, the theory that I like the most is the one that we call the amyloid cascade hypothesis in which we think that amyloid, the, the transition of amyloid beta from monomer to the fibrillar structure is associated with the onset of Alzheimer's. So actually, the first thing that happens is that you have this molecule, this protein inside the cells that is called the APP, this, the amyloid precursor protein. This protein, everybody has it. And, uh, it is inside the neurons, but it gets elongated and it gets caught in the, in the membrane of the cells by the proteins that are uh, called alpha, beta, and gamma secretase. And these alpha, beta, and gamma secretase are basically aspartyl proteases. They activate water molecules to perform proteolytic cleavage. So when they cut the protein, they release into the extracellular environment a protein that we call amyloid beta. This amyloid beta, we call it amyloid beta 1 to 40 or amyloid beta 1 to 42 because it has 40 amino acids or 42 amino acids depending on the place that it was caught. But in any way, uh, these things start aggregating, uh, forming this kind of like spaghetti network that uh, then deposit all over the brain. And it expands very rapidly because once you have formed a little bit, a little seed of amyloid beta, then this seed kind of like help uh, propagate the amyloid beta structure across the brain. So specifically, what do we study? Well, we study this peptide, amyloid beta peptide, 1 to 40. And what we really study is the transition of this molecule from this, which is monomeric, to this, which is fibrillar. And this is just a cross section. So this kind of like elongates in two dimensions. Uh, uh, to very, very, uh, very, very long uh, fibrils, uh, more than a few microns. The problem is that what we are detecting is the same protein. We have the same protein here and here. It's just a conformation of the protein that is changing. And if you look at two vials with monomer and aggregated protein, they're basically the same. You can do microscopy 
uh, TEM or AFM, but you will have to do the preparation, and uh, it will take you a few hours until you know if you have fibrillar proteins or not. What we want to do is to be able to detect amyloid beta fibrillation in real time. So what we found out is that this complex, ruthenium, BSBP, DPPZ, is capable of reporting an aggregation state of amyloid beta bond. So basically, if you have a vial with monomeric amyloid beta and ruthenium BSBP, DPPZ, you get nothing, no fluorescence. But if you get a vial with amyloid beta and ruthenium BSBP, DPPZ, you get a very strong fluorescent, very strong red color. So the ruthenium complex actually report on the aggregation state of this molecule. But not only that, uh, we can quantify that. So this is, this is by eye, right? Nothing, I'm very bright, but actually you can quantify it with a spectrofluorometer. This is a spectrum of ruthenium BSBP DPC in the presence of monomeric amyloid beta, basically no response, and in the presence of fibular amyloid beta, about a 50-fold increase. So that's, that's really good. So that's really what we wanted to get. Uh, 